let me show you the shortest path to becoming a data engineer in 2025. In this video, I'll give you my plan to getting into data engineering from either SQL or the engineering side and share how I'm going deeper into AI data engineering myself. But first, hi, I'm Chris. I'm a staff AI data engineer building data sets for an AI research team working on foundation time series models. I've been a data engineer for close to a decade. Now let's dive in. When we're starting out trying to get into data engineering, you need to look at what unfair advantage you have that you can leverage. I was a day trader writing Python scripts, and my first job closer to data engineering was becoming a backend engineer at a fintech company that had a trading platform. If you're more on the analyst side, take this SQL route, focus on DBT, focus on the analytics side, getting good at SQL, and following that path into data engineering. If you're a backend or software engineer in general right now, focus on this Python path to data engineering. If you know Java, start with Scala Spark instead of gutting into Python. The goal is to get useful enough to get a job in data engineering so you can continue to learn throughout your career. And it's much easier to learn when you're being paid to work on the thing you're interested in. Now, the, the core point of any career, but especially in data engineering, is you want to focus on the timeless general skills. AI is making it easy for syntax. That kind of stuff's replaceable. We have tools and frameworks that are interchangeable at this point. If I'm interviewing you and I see a billion things on your resume, I'm super suspicious, especially if you've only been out of school for seven months. So if you're taking the analytics route, you should lean into your SQL. You should understand data warehouses like a Snowflake or a Redshift. Have a high level overview of how database indices work, table locks, no modeling like dimensions versus fact tables. A SQL syntax, that's pretty replaceable. You definitely need to understand it at some level, but I think understanding the mechanisms behind how a database executes a query is more useful. Understanding when types of joins are more useful. This is kind of stuff you can do to correct AI is saying, oh yes, you give me this syntax, but we're not going to be doing a full outer join here. That's going to explode the number of rows we need. And that's ridiculous. And then the AI can say, oh yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. Thanks for telling me. That's where the human in the loop comes in. That's the timeless kind of stuff I'm talking about is you don't need to just hammer on SQL leak code problems, although that can help in prepping for interviews. DBT is an abstraction. It's not a skill, but it's definitely useful. Again, similar to Airflow, like to have exposure to it and try it, but you don't need to spend too much time on that tool. You want the, the foundational stuff, understanding how databases work, understanding how to write SQL. Uh, but more interesting is think about how you investigate the data. How do you explore the data? I can't believe how many people I've seen in interviews don't even explore the data before they start writing SQL in the question. So learn to love the data, learn to ask questions and be curious about the data. Learn how to tie that to business value. Now the rest of this video is mainly gonna focus on the software engineering path because that's the path I took and the one I can speak to the most. If you're just a general software engineer, you've probably played with Python. I would say dive deep there, that's pretty obvious. Have a good understanding of data structures, have a good understanding of how to make Python concurrent, how to write asynchronous Python clients. Get familiar with extracting data from APIs. You know, that was a take home test I had that I enjoyed very much. It, it was an internal API that had some fake issues baked into it. And you had to kind of explore the API, handle some errors, extract the data out, do a little transform and then write it to cloud storage. That was awesome. That was, that was a great test. That's the kind of stuff that I think actually matters on the job. I still do that to this day where I'm writing scripts for internal APIs and wrangling the data, handling errors. So if you can do that in the real world, I think that's a very useful skill to demonstrate. And that's the kind of project-driven learning you should strive for when you're learning Python. In data engineering, we have this ETL or ELT, where extract and you're transforming and then you're loading the data. At big companies like mine, entire teams are dedicated to individual steps there. So you don't necessarily need to know how to do every part of that pipeline or be an expert in each one. But picking one to focus on and then understanding how these things come together is useful. So extract, I would say use Python, hit some APIs, take some data, write it out to something like Iceberg, or at least do a Parquet file. If Great if you can do it to cloud storage. If you can use Amazon's free tier, I think they get a whole year. You can have five gigabytes of cloud storage in S3. You know, there's tools like Airbyte. You, again, get exposure to it, but you don't have to spend that much time there. And I would encourage you not to. I would also say like, don't stress the orchestration tool. Again, they're interchangeable. It's not that interesting. It's easy to learn on the job. Loading the data. This is maybe a little harder to learn because you might need to stand up a warehouse to load the data, but you can stand up a SQLite locally. Uh, again, also though, everybody's moving to the lake house. This was something I called out in 2023, but I mean, I, you know, I don't want to say I told you so, but moving to the lake house basically just means writing data to Apache iceberg. And that is just a metadata layer on top of your cloud storage. So that is a key component of data engineering in 2025. Iceberg's the evolution of cloud storage. We, we all used to live in this hive ecosystem where files were 
stuffed into folders and tables were basically sets of folders. Now with Iceberg, the key distinction is that a data set is a list of files and that enables so many more operations that you know is a whole separate topic right now. But if you don't have access to writing data out to an actual data warehouse or to Iceberg, because you do have to stand up an Iceberg catalog locally, if that's too much right now, just write Parquet files. I've not seen anything else in the past five years. I even have my daughter submit her homework as a Parquet file. It's, it's just everywhere. It's good to become familiar with it. And then if you want to get more advanced, try to try to put the data into cloud storage somewhere. But then on the transform side of things, as a data engineer, you're not going to be playing with pandas. Pandas are for the data scientists to play with. That is not going to be your department. Your job is to wrestle with Spark. Scale their pandas work, scale their research, and get it into Spark. That's where you come in. That's your value add. Spark is for the data engineers. If you're coming from a Java background, maybe Scala Spark is easier for you to get started with. If not, PySpark is totally fine. But understanding the fundamentals of how Spark works, the architecture of the, the driver, the executors. I, I have some general advice on how to use Spark. Again, this is like a completely separate video, but you want to understand the paradigm of Spark, how to avoid wide transformations and keep things narrow so you can avoid having data shuffle between executors to optimize your jobs. Um, you just want to play around with it and, and experiment a bit there. You don't necessarily, and again, need to go deep into the syntax. Again, syntax is replaceable with code gen these days. It's not important, but understanding how Spark works and what that means to be in a Spark environment is important. If you're more senior, having an idea of system design, things like how to build different pipelines for real-time use cases or batch use cases, but then also diving more into database architectures and database types, transactional workloads versus analytical, what structured versus unstructured data means, when to cache the data versus when to store it cold. And the more senior of a role you're looking for, that's when you maybe need this breadth so you can think about trade-offs between design decisions. But if that sounds like too much for you right now, maybe it is. And that's okay. You'll get there. But focus on building up one skill at a time. And then lastly, now we're going really deep. This is where I've been specializing, what I've been calling an AI data engineer. I think I'm starting to see that term pop up a bit more. And really, this is just a hat tip to the data requirements for teams building AI ML models or doing research on these is a bit different than the traditional sort of analytics workloads. Um, here, you know, it helps to nerd things like PyTorch and have an understanding of what a basic training loop is for a model. You don't really need to go deep on architecture or things like self-attention. You know, that I was doing that earlier this month. It was very interesting, but it's not very relevant for the data engineer. You don't need to go as deep as I did. Um, also playing with tools like Ray, like Ray is kind of interesting for last mile data processing. And it's also kind of a cool generic Python distributed framework for some things, but you know, it's not going to replace Spark. It even says itself, it's not trying to replace Spark. So you can't get out of learning Spark if you want to be a data engineer with big data. But one of the bigger problems I see on AI teams is really the data set management and iteration. Uh, so that's where tools like DBC might come in and it, it just allowing teams to have the ability to iterate and run multiple experiments in parallel. It's a, it's a bit of a challenge. And then getting the data into the right format and optimized for model training is also different. Uh, and one key insight I've had recently is that when we're building data sets for analytics, the data set is kind of taken in aggregate and, and to do analysis on the entire data set. When we're building data sets for machine learning or AI pipelines, the data set is a collection of samples that we might want to filter out or, or select subsets of those samples. So you have to structure and partition things a little bit differently with that in mind. And you also have to allow for more experimentation. Now, the best way to learn all this is to build something. I probably overcalibrated throughout my career for learning things formally, like taking courses, doing books, and taking a lot of notes. It feels good. You do learn stuff. But now with like AI as your sidekick, you can go from zero to something much quicker. You don't have to learn a whole bunch of stuff to know what the right question is. You can describe what you're doing. Like, hey, I'm learning to be a data engineer. Here's my background. And I want to go build this thing. Like, where should I start? I think the hardest thing before Gen AI could help you learn was you had to know enough to figure out what the questions were that you didn't know to ask. And now like AI can just sort of point you to that. So I think focusing more and over calibrating more on building projects is a great way to learn. One project I think you should start with is pick something that you like. The beautiful thing about data is it's everywhere. So you can apply these skills you learn to something you're genuinely interested in. Finding work you love is a topic for a different day, but at least now you can kind of find love in the work you do. So find a data set you think is interesting or find an API that you think is interesting. Like if you're into sports, I don't know, pull some stats from your favorite league or teams. Like I, I did some fantasy football projects back in the day. If you're into finance, also like I was into, pull some stuff from Yahoo Finance. You know, just pick a data set that you find interesting. Then write the Python code 
to pull from that API. Don't use anything like everybody. Just write a Python script, start pulling some data. And then when you scrape that data in, yes, you can use pandas uh, if you want to start. Uh, write it to Parquet. Write it out to Parquet files on your desktop. Figure out how to partition it locally. And then ask some questions about the data. Maybe even use PySpark to answer it. You know, do, can you join it with another data set? Can you do some transformations or some feature engineering to see something interesting? And then write it up. And the best part is if you're stuck, just Claude or O1 for ideas to help. Go deep when you don't know something. That's, that's what, this is how project-driven learning works, is you're actually doing something and you're coming across things that you wouldn't necessarily think about in theory. So struggle with it. If, if you have trouble setting up your environment, that's okay. That's part of the learning process. If you're not sure how to use Git in your workflow, take a minute and back up and solve that. When you hit something you don't know, it's okay. You're not trying to get this project done as quickly as possible. You're trying to learn through the project. Now, the, the important part is that you actually complete something. You're asking questions, you're learning as you go, and then you're communicating it clearly. That's what matters here. All right, so with all that, I hope you found this helpful. Focus on a few core tools. You don't need to learn everything at once. Go deep into those timeless fundamentals, the things that you can skill stack and build up over time. We're still going to need data engineers. You're investing in good skill set. Take your time and have fun. Find something you're interested in to apply your data skills to. It'll be more motivating, more rewarding. That genuine curiosity will come out of you. And hang in there because while it might not happen quick, it will happen. And three months, six months, a year is going to go by. And so it's up to you. How do you want to spend that time? It's an awesome career. I'm happy to talk more. Find me on LinkedIn again. Good luck. I can't wait to see what you do. See you in the next one.